Hello, I'm Furiha Roshin. I am the writer of Like a Bird. It came out uh, this week, September 15th. Um, I have been writing Like a Bird since I was 12 years old. Uh, so for 18 years, it's this 18th year. Um, and it's quite a feat, obviously. I don't know a lot of other writers that started writing a book at 12 and wrote for 18 years. Um, to completion so I'm, I'm pretty proud of myself and I think that really lends to the story and uh, lends to the value and importance of the story which is ultimately one of survival. I think that even when I started writing it at 12 I had an inherent understanding that abuse, particularly sexual abuse, is not something that any of us know how to talk about and least of all do we know how to protect the people that are put into these really awful circumstances um and what does survival look like outside of that that's something i'm really invested in personally because i didn't have a choice i had to find a way to survive and i wrote a book i started writing a book um and so it's a, it's a unique story in that sense, and it's something that I really hope resonates with audiences, and I think if put into the right hands, it will. Um, because ultimately, it, 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 in its completion, it is, in essence, sort of the proof that um, things do get better, and there are ways to sublimate the pain that you feel. Um, so shout out to Unnamed Press that really held me during this entire process. And I love indie booksellers because I buy from indie booksellers. I've been buying from indie booksellers since I was a teen um, in Sydney, Australia. Um, and all of my favorite bookstores are, are not commercial ones because uh, indie booksellers care about the work and they care about the writers and they care about nurturing people and community um and it's really an anti-establishment and uh a, a, a sort of anti-capitalist way to exist um protecting and and um and having and garnering beautiful relationships with your community so thank you for the work that you do um i hope like a bird resonates with you and um, I hope that you encourage people to buy it because this is my heart and soul. And um, more than that, more than just me, it's, I think, a story that will really hopefully help people to heal because I do believe that it's a toolkit. And I feel that the best kind of writing is a toolkit. The best kind of writing, whether from Toni Morrison to Octavia Butler to Etel Adnan, are about ways in which we can think about the future and exist in the future. And we're having to reimagine and think about that in so many different ways right now during this pandemic. So I think writing unifies us and it has an um, incredible way of teaching us and showing us truths that we didn't know ourselves or maybe we didn't know how to articulate. So yeah. I'm going to read a little from Like a Bird. This is chapter nine. We'd go to our house in the Catskills as often as we could. I loved that we had a home and nature, the trees, the cabins of iridescent design around us were all beckoning with a life that I wanted to lead. Whenever we were up north, I felt for a time that I was sincerely alive. And it was there that I understood what infinity really was. I would look at the stars and dream of the impossibility of the universe, of the cosmos. On one of those trips, I became obsessed with Carl Sagan and asked Bubba to find me books about string theory and quantum physics. He complied with my request. I felt there was so much beyond me without much to lose. In those moments, I felt purposeful. I can recall sitting at the edges of our patio, 
hanging from the timber like a stretching cat. I would find corners, lost sections, places I could carve as my very own and read for hours, turning pages with fingers or the nub of my nose. We owned a great big wooden house and everything was insanely symmetrical, lined and traced with the blades of a tree bark on the sides of a wall, a reminder that this world was theirs before it was ours. I heard Bubba come up from behind me, but we rarely talked, so I ignored him. I have something for you, he said. I was stunned, but I didn't turn around. It's a book. I quickly looked at him, and it was true. In his hand, he had a small paperback, black with bright light blue swirls on the cover. It read, The Elegant Universe. I sometimes felt Baba to be a man in the military, so composed, showing little to no emotion. Sometimes he'd pat me on the head, but today he smiled. I had a look inside, you know, it's very interesting. Over the years, he had developed a more American-ass transatlantic accent, and I liked hearing it. He gestured for me to come along, and we began walking down the steps toward the lake that was just a few yards south of our place. We were silent as we walked, but I cherished this time with him. We stopped at a bench and he sat down and looked at me, his eyes telling me to do the same. Baba communicated so much without words. I sat down as he spoke. I'm very scared of deep things, Talia of deep, unknown spaces. I didn't ask why. I always knew that if he wanted to tell me something, he would. The ocean, space, these things terrify me. I was amazed. My, my father never shared emotional anecdotes with us. Maybe it's because I don't know what's out there. I let that sit with me. I didn't know what was out there either, but I wanted to believe that whatever it was, it was something worthwhile. Life is cruel, Talia. You have to get used to knowing that. If you're prepared for that, then you're prepared for the worst. He looked at the ground. The lake was so still, a dark navy smudge like ink, a mystery. I sacrificed a great deal to get here, Talia. We were not a rich family. Your daddy ma and daddy G didn't have a lot of money, but they may do. They sent me to America to have a better life because that's what people in our culture do. They give their sons and daughters opportunities for a better life, but they sacrifice a lot to get me here and I owe them everything. I wondered if he was talking to me anymore. Nothing is as important as honor, Talia. I owe my parents everything and I will never forget that. This time he almost whispered it, nothing is as important as honor. He didn't embrace me, but instead, instead left it there, that statement to hang in the air, fragile and explosive in its honesty. As he said it, I remembered that the year previously he'd uttered the same words. We were in a taxi van in Malaysia on our way to India, Alyssa holding on to Mama as we swerved to the airport. Earlier that day, I saw a man with no eyes, hollowed out like ice cream scoops. I was still ruminating over the way his waxy hands gripped onto my shirt as I walked by, begging for money. Bubba looked at us, but also passed us, declaring one thing only, don't plan your lives, girls. Don't ever plan your lives. So yeah, that's the story of Talia. That's a little taste of of the story of Talia, my main character, and her journey to her own survival. And I really hope that, um, yeah, you invest in, in her and me. And uh, thank you for all that you do.